OK, so here's an example uh, for using uh, the thermodynamic relations that we, that we saw uh, last time. And uh, one of the, the most classical problems uh, that we'll see is uh, Cp minus Cv. Uh, we derived this actually in chapter 2 uh, to see that uh, for ideal gas, uh, Cp minus Cv is R, uh, the gas constant. Uh, but in fact, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you go back to chapter 2, you'll see that originally we have a form like this. So it means that uh, for Cp minus Cv, uh, it's, it is related to uh, partial V, partial T, and fixed uh, pressure. Uh, but there's uh, an actual term over here. It's P plus this term. And if you still remember, for ideal gas, uh, this second term, uh, partial U, partial V, at a constant temperature is zero. Right? So in the end, you only have uh, the first term, P times this one. So that's for ideal gas. But now we're dealing with, you know, uh, for all matters, uh, all kinds of materials. So we'll start from this general form. And recall that one of the relations uh, that we saw last time uh, for the pressure, it can be represented by the, uh, sorry, the differential uh, between uh, this uh, Hempel's free energy and volume. And if you plug this in, you'll see that uh, you can replace this term by this uh, minus partial A partial B. And the reason why we use this one uh, it's because we want this to have the same uh, constant. We fix the temperature. So in order to replace uh, pressure, we choose partial A, partial V, because that will give us uh, the condition at fixed temperature. Okay? And we also know that, uh, by definition, Hempel's free energy is U minus Ts. So if you expand that, you realize that there is one term that can be eliminated. Uh, okay, so this term will be eliminated, so you are left with this T partial S partial V. Okay, this is by definition. And in the end, you have this, but like I mentioned last time, uh, if you have something with partial S partial something, you typically need to replace that with something else. So a rule of thumb, is that whenever you see something with uh, whenever you see this uh, if something is related to partial x, partial x with fixed y or fixed z, uh, try to replace that with one of the Maxwell relations. Okay? And of course, based on this one, uh, it, it is partial s, partial v at fixed temperature. And we replace that with partial p, partial t. Okay? And if you don't know why, let, let's go back to here. Again, we have these four sets of relations uh, that we can use. And for this problem, uh, for this problem, we're using this one. So later we'll see that there are some cases. You'll see partial S, partial P with fixed temperature. Then you will replace that with partial V, partial T uh, at a fixed pressure. So uh, that's the reason why I boxed these two uh, equations because uh, those are uh, these two are very frequently used uh, at least in this chapter so that's the reason why I mentioned uh, this is a rule of thumb that whenever you see this uh, please replace that otherwise you know you won't be able to derive the things that the textbook asks you okay so Eventually, we have something like this. And now you'll see that all these factors are related to V and P and T. So that's another rule of thumb. So this is the first one. The second one is make sure 
This is another rule of thumb. Um, make sure that the expression, the final expression that you have uh, is only related to P, P uh, the pressure, the volume, and or the temperature. And eventually, we will change those things, uh, partial differentials, into alpha and beta. Uh, those are the uh, thermal, I think, uh, what, this one is compressibility. This is a thermal uh, coefficient, expansion coefficient. So uh, later we'll see that again. So the first thing is that if you have partial differential related to S, replace that with Maxwell relations, and then make sure your final expression is only related to P and V and T, and eventually you can summarize your uh, expression or further simplify your expressions uh, with alpha and beta, okay? So right now we're here. And another trick that uh, the textbook used for this, uh, for this problem is that uh, we use upstairs, downstairs, inside our formula, okay? So the reason why we use that is because here we have partial t, P partial T, but this is not related to alpha and beta yet. Uh, if you still remember, alpha is related to uh, it's related to partial v partial t, and beta is related to uh, I think partial v partial p it's at fixed temperature. So right now we're still having partial P and partial T. So that's not a term that we can determine experimentally. The reason why we want alpha and beta is because for these two terms, uh, they can be determined experimentally. You can use measurements. You change the pressure, you measure the volume change. Uh, you measure temperature and then you measure the volume change. So even this seems to be already simplified, but this is not enough. Therefore, uh, we use the upstairs, downstairs, inside our relation. To replace this with partial P, partial V, and partial V, partial T. So in the end, uh, we will have something like this. Uh, sorry, this is T. Uh, constant pressure uh, expansion coefficient. So now you have these three, and then you put alpha and beta, the definition of alpha and beta in, because we know that alpha is this term uh, over V, and this one is this, normalized by the volume. So after you simplify this uh, with the thermal expansion coefficient and compressibility, um, you end up with a very simple form. Okay, so the difference between CP and CV is V times T alpha square and beta, over beta, okay? So uh, a general rule uh, for solving a problem is something like this, okay? And the reason why, again, uh, we want to express this term as a combination of, for instance, volume, temperature, and alpha and beta, it's because for alpha and beta, these are the only two things that we can determine experimentally, okay? And of course, volume and temperature themselves uh, can be measured uh, by uh, experiment as well. But for instance, if you have something like this, then you know that although you can measure temperature, but you cannot measure partial P, partial T. And that's the reason why we want to change them into uh, the product of these two, using the upside, uh, upstairs, downstairs, inside, out formula. So this is just a general example. Uh, I think that's uh, in, in the textbook as well. And 
to use that uh, to do num numerical calculations. Uh, this is provided by the textbook as well. Um, so these are uh, experimentally determined values. So once you know the volume, you know the temperature, and if you know alpha and beta, uh, typically the problem will tell you, then you should be able to calculate uh, CP and CV, uh, or the difference between these two. So this problem uh, tells you that uh, CP is 24.36 uh, joule per mole Kelvin. So it tells you the, uh, this is a constant pressure uh, heat capacitance or molar uh, heat capacitance. And it also tells you uh, the values of alpha, beta, and the density of, uh, of your material and the atomic weight uh, of your material. And it asks you to find CV. So what is uh, CV for this uh, material? Which is aluminum in this case at 20 degrees Celsius. So now you know uh, for if you're going to use this uh, formula, uh, the temperature should be uh, say 293 Kelvin. And, and you also know alpha and you also know beta. But this is, this, in this problem actually the hardest part is to estimate volume. And in this case it's the molar volume because uh, we're using CP, a small CP and small CV which means that we're estimating the uh, heat capacitance uh, per mole. So this is a molar heat capacitance. And the derivation, of course, like I mentioned, uh, the hardest part is actually for the volume. So we want to know like, how many liters uh, of aluminum that we will have for one mole of that. So that's the reason why the problem will give you uh, these two information. You have to use these two information to, uh, to calculate uh, the molar volume uh, of aluminum. And it turns out that this is 0.01 liters per mole. And then you just plug in uh, this uh, molar volume into the expression that you already derived. And so it turns out that CP minus CV is a very small number. Okay, so in terms of liter at, uh, ATM per mole Kelvin, it's uh, about 10 to the minus two. But if you want to change that into uh, Joule, uh, remember you have to uh, make a conversion between the two gas constants. I think you encounter this a lot uh, when you do the calculations in chapter two or chapter three. So bear in mind that uh, the unit is very important. In this case, uh, we want to change that into uh, Joule per mole Kelvin. So uh, you have to use this ratio, uh, 8.314 over uh, the 0.08. So it turns out that CP minus CV is 1.23. So if you compare that uh, to the original value of CP, um, this is a very small number because we know that uh, CP is 24.36 and the difference between CP and CV is only 1.23. Of course, uh, CV is uh, 23 ish, like 23.13 joule per mole Kelvin. But you'll see that the difference between CP and CV is small. And this is very different from ideal gas, right? If you still re remember for ideal gas, uh, the difference between CP and CV is R, okay? It's R. And we know that this is. Uh, about eight. But in this case, when we're dealing with uh, solid, when we're dealing with solid, uh, the difference between CP and CV seems to be much smaller. Uh, it, it is only 1.23. And therefore, for solids, uh, typically we will state that uh, CP is close to CV. So for ideal gas, say it's R, but for solids, 
let's say is close to zero, although in this case it is not zero, right? It is 1.23. We know that this will be a small number. Okay, this will be a small number. Uh, so in chapter six, we'll see that uh, we made some assumptions that when we try to derive CV using uh, some physics, uh, physicist uh, method, uh, and then, but eventually we'll state that this is close to CP. And so this is another example of uh, the difference between uh, gas, uh, specifically ideal gas, and uh, solids. And if you don't understand why, uh, can you imagine that for ideal gas, they are free to expand, right? So when you do the constant pressure, um, say, uh, when you heat up uh, your, uh, your gas, gas system uh, under constant pressure process, uh, the gas are free to expand. So CP will be much larger uh, than the solid case. For the solid case, because uh, those atoms are bound to each other, uh, so they are not free to move around. So the expansion is not as dramatic uh, as gas. So that's the reason why for solids, CP is close, close to CV. Because the volume change when you heat up your solid, uh, solid material is not as dramatic as gas. Okay, so that's the, uh, the physical origin of why uh, the difference between these two uh, are very small. Okay. And like I mentioned earlier that the, uh, uh, the sixth edition of the textbook is actually pretty good. So uh, especially for 510, I think for this section, uh, it sort of summarizes uh, the, uh, the expressions that we, we've already discussed last time in a more systematic way. So uh, these two are the most important relations that you, you probably don't need to memorize, but you have to understand that uh, the reason why we always end up with something that's related to alpha and beta is because these two terms can be determined experimentally. Okay. You change the temperature and then you measure the volume change. Or you fix the temperature and then you enforce pressure onto your material and then see the volume change. So therefore, for these two quantities, you can just directly measure that. And the first one, of course, isobaric thermal expansivity or expansion coefficient uh, is partially partial T uh, and it is normalized by volume. And the second one, beta, is with a minus sign over there it's because uh, typically, when you increase the pressure, the volume will decrease, right? So this is a negative number. Therefore, you put a negative sign in front of it, then this is a positive number, okay? If you still remember over here, uh, the beta that we just saw is a positive number, okay? But it, doesn't, it does not mean that when you increase the pressure, um, the volume will, will become bigger. Uh, it's quite the opposite. Okay. When you increase the pressure, the volume will decrease. But you, if you have a minus sign here, so beta is a, a positive number. And more importantly, like I mentioned several times, uh, these are measurables uh, that can be determined experimentally. So for 510, I think they listed, um, it lists uh, this uh, two TDS equations. We've already seen these two, actually. Uh, the first one, the first TDS equation starts from expression, uh, expressing uh, entropy as a function of temperature and volume. And due to that, when you do the perfect differential, they will become partial F partial T, and there's a second term that's related to partial S partial V. And we already know that for the first term, it is related to the internal energy only, so it is NCV over T. Or in the textbook, I think it is already uh, the, molar, uh, the molar entropy change. So uh, in the textbook, you'll see that there's no N over here. Okay, so sometimes I think there's a difference between the sixth edition and fifth edition. Uh, in the fifth edition, uh, typically we will still see this N over here, but uh, in the uh, sixth edition, 
uh, I think it took out the, uh, this uh, molar factor, uh, this uh, number of particles in the system. But since this is actually, a, uh, I would say, a extensive property, so I still put an N over here. Okay. But if you want to co uh, calculate a molar, a molar change, uh, then you, you have to uh, remove this factor N. And of course, for the second term, again, this is the thing that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you have partial S partial something, <coughs> typically, if you can find that in the Maxwell relations, uh, just replace that with, for instance, partial P partial T. Uh, that's the same with uh, what we just went through uh, earlier. And of course, you will ask, then, what about this thing? But if you go back to this slide, you'll see that there's no partial S partial T, right? So you, you cannot find that expression in the Maxwell relations uh, or in these four sets of uh, formulas, then uh, you should keep it that way, okay? You should just keep it that way. But if you're dealing with something that has already been derived, just replace that uh, with this expression. So if you multiply both sides by temperature, then you arrive at the first TDS uh, equation. Then uh, the first term, of course, is still related to CVDT. And this is related to the internal energy. And the second term is related to partial P, partial T. And we already know that you can, again, change this term uh, by using the, uh, the upstairs, downstairs, inside out uh, formula. And then you arrive at alpha over beta. So again, uh, you make sure that expression uh, in this case, is a second term, uh, partial P, partial T, uh, as a fi at a fixed volume, it's only related to P and V and T. And then you want to express that term uh, with something related to alpha and beta. So uh, in the end, it is alpha over beta over here. Okay. And the second TDS equation is the same. Uh, we will start from the expression of entropy, but now we express entropy as a function of a temperature and pressure. So you'll see that again, uh, we, we have these four uh, variables and we want to express uh, entropy because the reason why we single this out is because this one is the unique one. Right? This is a, a state function that is related to, uh, say, the irreversibility and you know, the, the state of the, the, uh, the system. Uh, while these can be variables. So it's either SVT or you know, STP as a you know, function of temperature pressure. So I think whenever you start from entropy, Keep in mind that it's a function of the temperature and volume or temperature or pressure. And we almost never use this. Uh, we, we almost never use this uh, in, in the field of thermodynamics. Okay. And therefore, the second TDS, we start from uh, expressing entropy as a function of temperature and pressure. And then we do the same thing. We expand that. And of course, the first term is, the, uh, is related to enthalpy, uh, Cp over T. And the second term, again, we use one of the uh, relations that we derived. And it will become partial V partial T at fixed pressure, but with a minus sign. Okay? So that's the reason why I boxed the, uh, I boxed the minus sign as well. And so in the end, TDS is something like this. And if you know like this partial V partial T at fixed pressure, uh, this is uh, directly the, uh, related to the uh, thermal expansion coefficient. 
and therefore, uh, the second term is very simple. It's actually minus alpha v times t dp. And we will see this, uh, this equation um, in, chapter, in chapter 6 because we want to calculate uh, the enthalpy delta H uh, for different material systems. And in some cases, we, we measure delta H under different temperatures, and we also measure delta H uh, at different pressures. So this expression will tell us how to calculate that. Okay. So uh, in fact, for these two uh, results, uh, the second one is more common. Uh, you'll see this more, uh, except especially in chapter 6. You'll see this again. So that's the reason why uh, I think this is more common uh, for most of the thermodynamic calculations. Okay. And the ones we just saw are for uh, entropy. And we can also look into um, the energy equation. Uh, for instance, if we start from internal energy, and of course from the first law, uh, du is TDS minus PdV, and therefore partial U partial V at fixed temperature uh, can be expressed as something like this. We we've seen this several times, uh, either in the uh, I think in the, in the midterm and also um, last week, I think, and. Therefore, if you have a term, partial S, partial V, at a fixed temperature here, again, you replace that uh, by using um, the philosophy over here, and you'll get partial P, partial T at a fixed volume. And remember that for ideal gas, uh, you can directly calculate this, and it turns out to be uh, exactly the same as P, and then this will be zero, right? Uh, that's how we derive for ideal gas, partial U, partial V at a fixed temperature should be zero. And for the second energy equation, uh, we go through that for enthalpy. And, and dH, again, is TDS plus VDP. Um, so you, if you don't know like, how to derive this, uh, please um, make sure that you know this before taking the second midterm because uh, this is probably the most important, I, I mean, these kind of derivation is probably the most important thing. You start from the first law, and you start from the definition of H, and then you take dH and then uh, expand all of them. I think I derived that already last time uh, on the blackboard, uh, not just going through the slides. So partial P, par, uh, sorry, partial H, partial P uh, at a fixed temperature will give you a very, very similar expression and then you replace this uh, again with one of the Maxwell relations, and then you'll end up with uh, this uh, partial V, partial T over here. And again, it turns out that typically for partial V, partial T, uh, it is related to alpha, so it's much easier to uh, integrate you know, into the term over here. So it turns out that it's volume times one minus alpha T. And this expression is also very simple. And we'll also see this in chapter six. Uh, so this is sort of the preview of what we will see in chapter six. Okay, so in chapter six, six we'll see a lot of calculations that's uh, related to delta H. And in order to calculate that for, for instance, for different, temp, uh, for different pressure, uh, we have to use partial H, partial P. And then it turns out to be uh, V times that. Okay, so that's, um, that's the things that we, uh, we probably should know uh, before going into chapter six. And again, uh, if you come in late, uh, at the very beginning I mentioned that there's uh, the video for uh, helping you to go through chapter five, uh, especially providing you a, a way to memorize, uh, to memorize and derive, like how to derive uh, those uh, partial differential uh, relations. And it's already been up uploaded. And if you look on SEVA, there's also this video. And so the, the philosophy behind chapter five is very simple. That you have four variables, independent variables, and then you have four functions 
And we want to see that uh, how to express, for instance, UAGH as a function of SV and TAP. And if you write down this kind of matrix, uh, then uh, the, the relations should be pretty straightforward. Because for instance, like for uh, enthalpy, we know that that's the, the function of S and P. That's the best way to express um, H. Um, I'm not sure if we, well, and let's say if we want to know this, we'll start from DH is equal to something. And eventually, you know, realize that it is related to something with DS and DP. Uh, if you don't remember, we can always go back, but we can actually just use this term over here. If you know how to derive that, then you'll know why uh, H is put between, in between S and P. And that's the same for, for instance, U, A, and G, because G will be expressed as a function of T and P. Okay. So please go through that, like if you don't remember. Uh, personally, I think a lot of you don't need to memorize this, but uh, if you want to make sure that you, know, you, you, you can derive these uh, expressions or partial differential relations very quickly, uh, of course you can memorize this. Okay, so that's, um, that's chapter five. And and chapter six is actually uh, quite interesting because they are actually divided into two parts. Okay. Um, for the very first part, we're going to talk about heat capacity uh, for solids. And the second part, probably the most important part, is like to tell you how to calculate delta H. And then there are Therefore, we'll be having a lot of uh, calculations, uh, especially for the homework. Uh, I think chapter six uh, involves uh, a lot of calculations. But let us um, recall that, uh, the definition of heat capacity. Actually, we've already seen this uh, throughout this semester uh, for, for, for many, many times. Uh, the heat capacity, of course, is defined as uh, depending on the condition, like it's either a constant pressure process or a constant volume process, you have uh, to use either internal energy or the enthalpy, right? We've already seen this before. And also that's the reason why we have, uh, like for instance, CVDT and CPDT uh, for the TDS equations that we just saw earlier. And you know, for the reason why we use capital CV and capital CP here, uh, you know, the bigger one, bigger uh, alphabets, is because uh, these two terms, if you express that way, will be extensive property. Okay, so it depends on the size of the system. So we count the, uh, um, the how many moles of the particles in the system into account uh, if we express uh, the heat capacity that way. Okay, so if something is an ex extensive property, then uh, especially in the sixth edition, I think typically it will use something prime uh, as the denoted value of uh, the, uh, the property of the entire system. So that's an extensive uh, property. And if you're using uh, the variable without a prime uh, on top of it, then it is for the um, uh, property per unit mole of the system, which means that it's an ex intensive property. So in short, uh, if you want to express this um, as an intensive property, you have to divide this term, uh, the capital CV and capital CP uh, with N. So that's the reason why we have N over here, okay? So if you're using uh, du, for instance, that u is an extensive property, then uh, you use the, uh, the capital CV here, and therefore you have n over here. Um, I don't think this, uh, this definition is very consistent in the, uh, the fifth edition if you're still using 
uh, the last edition of the textbook, but uh, it should be pretty consistent uh, in, in the new version. So if you're seeing something that is with a prime, uh, just keep in mind that it means that it's extensive. Um, but what we're interested in is, of course, uh, these intensive properties that's independent of the size of the system. And so CP and CV are the molar heat capacities. And uh, of course, CP means for constant pressure, and CV is for constant volume. And if we integrate uh, between the states, for instance, uh, the same pressure, because for instance, for CP, we're dealing with constant pressure process, so the pressure is fixed. Uh, but we have a temperature change uh, from T1 to T2. If we want to calculate um, the heat involved during a process uh, from T1 to T2, then the delta H can be expressed as something like this. And it's simply the integration of CP over uh, the temperature from T1 to T2. So this is fairly uh, straightforward. And uh, I think in chapter six, uh, you will see a lot of this kind of calculation. Uh, but of course, if you are dealing with a constant volume process, then you have to use internal energy. So it turns out that you're integrating over CV uh, against temperature. Um, but actually in this chapter, uh, at least for most of the examples uh, and the, the problem sets, uh, you'll see this, uh, the first one more frequently because delta H is related to, for instance, the formation heat and the heat release uh, or absorb during the chemical reaction. So uh, we'll see a lot of calculations uh, related to delta H. Okay, so these uh, sort of gives the dependence of H uh, and of course also U on temperature uh, once the temperature dependence of CP and CV are known. So previously, if you just see this, of course you can imagine that uh, or assume that CP is a constant, right? It's just a number. But in fact, for most materials, um, the constant pressure heat capacity uh, will be a function of temperature, which means that uh, this is a function of temperature and if you do the integration, you have to know the uh, explicit form of that in order to do the calculation. So at the very beginning of this chapter, uh, what we're going to do is to figure out what will be that uh, temperature dependence. Uh, what is CP as a function of temperature? Okay, we'll see that uh, later. Okay. Uh, actually here uh, are the uh, results, or I would say the, the most important relations that will be used in this chapter. Um, I think the first one we've already seen uh, in this slide that uh, delta H should be related to CP. So whenever you want to calculate delta H, uh, you have to know the temperature dependence of uh, constant pressure heat capacity. Uh, of course, if you're dealing with, for instance, this is extensive, like if you're dealing with like uh, more than one moles of a uh, material, uh, remember that you have to have a end over here, like depending on how large your system is. Okay, so this is just a general expression, uh, for instance, over here. Uh, but if you're dealing with, for instance, uh, like 100 moles of uh, aluminum, and if you want to calculate due to H uh, as uncertain, you know, for um, a change from temperature one to temperature two, then you have to uh, plug in like 100 moles over here. So it really depends on uh, the expression of this term and whether this is an extensive or intensive property. Um, but in some cases, we're just dealing with like molar heat, right? If it's, it's a molar heat, uh, then this is one, then you don't have to worry about this because this is molar heat capacity. And that's the same for entropy. So in this chapter, actually, uh, what are majorly involved are these two things. So you uh, calculate delta H, uh, 
uh, you also calculate del delta s. And for delta s, uh, it's very, very, uh, uh, also very simple. You just uh, divide Cp uh, by temperature, right? And then you do the integration. So as long as you have um, the expression of Cp as a function of temperature, uh, if this is given, then you should be able to calculate that. And that's the same for entropy. So this is for the constant pressure or isobaric process. And I think that's the most common uh, case that we will see in this chapter. Uh, but at the very end of this chapter, uh, the textbook also mentioned that for um, if you have a pressure change, that will also give you a delta H. Okay, so in this case, for instance, if you fix the temperature, which means that it's an isothermal process, and then you change the pressure, uh, so the temperature is fixed, but the pressure evolves from pressure one to pressure two. If you want to do the calculation, you cannot use CP. Uh, you have to use uh, this thing to integrate over pressure. And if you still, if you don't remember that, um, I think actually we derived this just during the last hour, right? Um, for dH, you can expand that uh, as a function of dS, uh, I mean, in terms of dS and dP. And that's from the dP term, OK? And therefore, once you know the volume, and if you know alpha, and you know the temperature because this is a constant, then you should be able to, um, how do you say, uh, calculate this. Um, but of course, it is possible that volume is a function of pressure, right? This V, perhaps it is a function of pressure, or probably alpha is also a function of pressure. So it really depends on uh, these information are given or not. So if you know these information, you should be able to calculate this. And that's the same for delta S. Uh, it turns out to be uh, minus alpha V. And if you know, again, a volume as a function of pressure and the uh, expansion coefficient as a function of pressure, you should be able to calculate this, uh, integrate over dP. So although these two are you know, not as commonly seen as this one, uh, or these two, but um, I think, I believe there are one or two problems that is related to uh, the calculation of delta H and delta S uh, when you change the pressure, uh, when you change the pressure. So I guess these are the four like very general form or expressions to calculate delta H and delta S for this chapter. And that's it. So for all the calculations that's been done uh, in this chapter, you know, can be explained by these things, okay? And that's it. But of course, uh, like I mentioned um, earlier, that this CP as a function of temperature is what we want to explain. Uh, for instance, if no information is given, then what should we do with this CP as a function of temperature? And starting from 6.2, the textbook goes into the explanation of uh, how people determine this uh, experimentally and how to derive the uh, theory uh, to explain what they observed. So uh, from some empirical results, which means that it's from experiments, uh, Dulong and Petit, uh, they found that, uh, this is in early 19th century, that the molar heat capacity uh, of all solid materials, so not related to gas, Okay, so for gas, there are different systems. Now we're dealing with solids. So in chapter six, again, we're dealing with uh, solids. So that's the reason why uh, here, you know, you see alpha over here, instead of using the ideal gas law to eliminate that. So here we're dealing with solids. Um, the molar heat capacity of all solids elements have the value of 3R, uh, which is uh, 24.9 joule per Kelvin mole. Okay, um, three R, which means that it's uh, three by like 8.31 something. So it's roughly like 25. Okay, roughly 25 joule per Kelvin mole. Um, so they imagine that for all the solids, 
um, the internal structure seems to be very similar. And therefore, the, the capability of uh, absorbing heat for all solids seems to be having the same trend. Okay? So CP means, again, CP is defined as this, right? So it means that uh, the capability of absorbing heat for all solids seems to be having a universal law. But, I mean, therefore, uh, Cobb, this is another, uh, uh, I think, chemist. Yeah, 19th, in 19th century, uh, also states that uh, the mole heat capacity of a solid chemical compound, so if you have a compound, then it's approximately equal to the sum of mole heat capacity of its uh, constituent chemical elements. So if you have, like for instance, aluminum oxide, then the heat capacity of aluminum oxide should be related to that of aluminum and also oxygen, right? So um, this is also very intuitive, okay? But later experiments, uh, they show that the heat capacity will increase with increasing temperature. So there are several factors that will affect your uh, understanding of what Dulong and Petit states. First of all, I, I think you all have this, right? So I'll get erase this. So What Delon and Petit states that is that for all materials, uh, solid materials, the CP, um, the molar heat capacity should be a constant and seems to be independent of temperature. But later experiments show that uh, it's actually slightly depends on temperature. So I'm going to draw that more uh, exaggerated. So later experiments show that uh, it's actually increasing with respect to temperature. Uh, more importantly, um, you have significantly lower values and lower than 3R at lower temperatures. So if you go down to low temperatures, say if it's close to zero Kelvin, you'll see something like this. It will go down to zero, which means that the capability of absorbing heat uh, will gradually decrease uh, when you go down to cryogenic temperatures. And the temperature dependence you know, of the molar heat capacity actually depends on temperature and the corresponding elements. So depending on what are the uh, constituent elements in the material system, you'll see different kinds of trend. And more importantly, uh, this temperature dependence cannot be explained by the theory proposed by uh, the classical approach. So you can say that this is a, a classical approach. So we want to find new theories such that we can explain this thing. I mean, this trend when you go down to zero temperature. And in reality, you'll see something like this. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this is more or less exaggera uh, exaggerated. So although you'll see a linear trend over here, but it's not uh, as dramatic uh, as in the experimental results, okay? Uh, although it is indeed having this linear trend. So for instance, if we're plotting um, the uh, heat capacity or molar heat capacity uh, for all these uh, single element uh, materials, where it's a lead, uh, copper, silicon, and diamond, which is carbon, uh, you'll see that um, they all behave similarly. Okay? They, 
all start from zero uh, when you start from zero temperature. And, uh, see. and if you go up to some certain temperature, you start to saturate at, uh, say, around 25. And again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, 25 is the classical value. Right, the classical value. This one is uh, three R. This is around, let's say, twenty-four point nine joule per mole Kelvin. Okay, so this is a classical value. So typically, you'll see something like this. And for different materials. You know, they could have different slopes uh, when you go down to zero temperature, but eventually they all saturate uh, at 3R uh, when you go to higher temperatures. So it seems to um, many physicists that uh, if you can normalize this, somehow you can converge all the lines for different materials into one. Uh, so therefore, I mean, for physicists, they typically want to find uh, for the uh, universality class. Uh, so is, is there any universality uh, for all those materials? So it turns out that actually later we'll see that if you can normalize uh, these curves along the temperature axis uh, you know, by some certain factor, uh, these lines will actually converge just into one. So if you can normalize them uh, by using some factor uh, in terms of temperature, they will converge into the same line. Uh, which means that uh, the same theory should apply to all the materials. And there's only one like material dependent factor that you have to, uh, for instance, determine experimentally. And, but the basic physics behind all the heat capacities or the physics behind absorbing heat for all materials are the same. Okay? Uh, so theoretical the first theoretical approach uh, was proposed by Einstein uh, in the early 20th century, so almost 100 years later uh, than the, uh, the classical theory. And that is because at that time, uh, it was the birth of quantum physics. So he borrowed some uh, concept from quantum physics to explain uh, this uh, decreasing trend. So his model is fairly simple. This is called the Einstein model. And he borrowed that from quantum theory. And he states that the crystal contains, for instance, n atoms. Uh, and each atom will behave like, uh, like a harmonic oscillator. So this is a very generic approach in quantum physics. So for some particle system that you don't know, you assume them to be having some harmonic oscillator. And it turns out that this is uh, a more or less like fair approach. So they assume that this is a harmonic oscillator for each atom or for the ion in the material and they are vibrating uh, independently about this lattice point. So uh, the key word here is actually this independent. Uh, they are vibrating independently. So they don't really have much interaction uh, with the neighboring atoms. Uh, so the, the, the figure here is OK, but uh, I don't think we should use a spring to uh, connect them. Or even if they have a spring, it's not that strong. So please bear in mind that for Einstein model, uh, they have um, in the materials, those atoms are like independent uh, harmonic oscillators. So they don't really couple to each other with a strong coupling. Although they are vibrating right next to each other, but they are not really having this strong coupling. And therefore, each oscillator, it has a certain frequency, mu, of its own. Uh, you can say this is the uh, frequency of, um, uh, that corresponds to ground energy or the ground state of the, uh, the oscillator. But you know, the bottom line is that uh, the frequency won't be affected by uh, the neighboring atoms. 
So, for instance, if you have a gold, you know, uh, a bulk of gold, and all the gold atoms, you know, in this bulk, they are uh, oscillating on its own. They are not going to be affected by neighboring uh, gold atoms. And so, a system of such oscillator is called an Einstein crystal. Well, well, you can say it's an Einstein crystal, or just this model is Einstein model. So according to quantum physics, you know, those energy levels can be expressed uh, very simply. And we know that uh, if you solve for the uh, Schrodinger equation, it turns out that the eigenvalues, uh, which corresponds to the energy levels of those oscillators, uh, will be having equal you know, uh, energy differences between them you know, for each energy level. And therefore, the energy level can be expressed as uh, some con this is not a constant. This is an integer plus one half times h uh, mu product. So, it means that um, the energy level is something like this, or uh, my this is from a textbook, though. I mean, personally, I prefer this. Uh, I typically prefer using h bar omega. I think you probably also know this from high school physics, uh, that this is a frequency. This is the angular frequency. So uh, I personally prefer it this way. Um, and this i is an integer. So it will start from 0. And we know that for if you draw the energy level out, uh, this is I being 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We've already seen this uh, in chapter 4. And this is the ground state. So it has an energy of 1 half um, times h bar omega, or 1 half h mu. And that's the, the ground state. And th this is the zero point energy. Okay. So this is by solving the, uh, this is acquired by solving Schrodinger equation. Although here, you know, we don't, I mean, at least in the textbook, it doesn't show you how to derive this. But if you want to know that, this is from the uh, uh, solving the Schrodinger equation and then uh, figure out the eigenvalues uh, of uh, those eigenstates. Okay, but the bottom line is that this is the energy uh, levels or the possible energy states you know, for each oscillator. And if you want to calculate the total energy, then of course you have to sum over you know, all the energy of all the particles in these energy levels. And if you still remember uh, from chapter four, we have this kind of distribution Right? And this distribution is related to exponential minus epsilon i over uh, kdt. So in order to calculate the total energy, we have to figure out like how many, for instance, oscillators will be in the ground state, how many of them will be in the uh, first excited states. And then we have to sum all the energy of all these oscillators and that will become the total internal energy of the system. Uh, we've already done this uh, in chapter four, right? So, but in here, uh, you'll see that besides this sum, summation over all the possible energies and the numbers of particles, uh, we also have a three over here. Uh, that corresponds to the three degrees of freedom of the oscillator, because uh, this is only for uh, the eigenenergy or the eigenvalues along one direction, for instance, x direction. But in fact, you know, we have a three-dimensional system, so we have to consider um, the motion you know, of those, uh, say, lattice points or atoms uh, along x and y and z directions. So that you have three directions. So it means that, okay, so if you want to calculate the total energy, there's a factor of three uh, in front of it. So uh, after that, it's just math. First thing 
is that we need to figure out what will be the NI, and that's already been done uh, in chapter four. Right, still remember that, that here you have the partition function, here you have the partition function, and this is the total number, so this is the, the ratio, the Boltzmann factor that I just uh, wrote down. So um, here we want to know Ni, so this is, this is N times the partition function, something like this, right? And this is the total number, and this is Uh, the beta here is is, is this, uh, not the uh, compressibility, of course. Uh, so it turns out to be very simple, very straightforward. So if you want to calculate that, just plug this in um, to the uh, total energy expression. Uh, so therefore, you have the energy uh, times the number of particles at that certain energy level. And now it's just math. Uh, don't worry about this, uh, won't go into exam. So, um, because this is just uh, simple math. Uh, if you do this, you can expand that. Um, it turns out to be fairly simple. You have the, uh, again, a term that corresponds to the ground state, the zero point energy, which is very straight, straightforward because we know that for each oscillator, uh, the ground state is having uh, one half of h bar omega or one half h mu. So if you have n, kind, um, you know, n kinds of those oscillators and you have three degrees of freedom, so it's natural to have a three over two plus n h mu, right? This is for, that corresponds to the, uh, uh, the ground state energy. Uh, but then you also have this extra term that depends on the temperature. So you can imagine that if the temperature is higher, then you have more particles you know, in the higher energy states uh, so the total energy, internal energy, will become a, a larger number. Uh, so that's cor that corresponds to uh, the second term, you know, the second term over here. But the bottom line is that it has a ground state energy, which is a constant, and there's a term that depends on the temperature. Uh, so the next is more math to eliminate that. If you have time, you can go through that. If you don't have time, it's fine with me because, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, this week, that you know, it's probably that you'll never study thermodynamics again in the future. So if you don't remember this, it's OK for me. You know, that's just my personal perspective. Uh, there are a lot of things that's more important in your life. This is not the most important thing. <laughs> OK. Uh, at least that's not for me. OK, I'm pretty sure. Um, but the result is pretty straightforward. Again, like I mentioned earlier, there's a, a term that corresponds to the ground state. Um, and there's a second term that corresponds to the energy, uh, sorry, the temperature. Uh, so if you have a higher temperature, the total energy will become larger, but the ground state energy is still the same. It's always like that. So imagine that if you go down to zero temperature, uh, if you have zero temperature, then this term this ex exponential term will become very large, right? So the second term is essentially zero. It's essentially zero. But you still have the ground state energy here. So what does that mean? So when you go down to zero temperature, all these, uh, all these oscillators, they will occupy the ground states. So at zero temperature, we know that the distribution is very simple, that you know, all the particles are uh, all the oscillators are in the ground state. Therefore, you only have this ground state energy. Okay? But if you raise the temperature to greater than zero Kelvin, of course, you start to have some particles here. Then you start to see the contribution from the second term. Okay. Well, these are just some, some math trick, like because we have an exponential summation like. You define this as x, and you, know, you have a series of x, and you do some math trick that you can derive this. Uh, actually, this is what Einstein did um, when he derived this, and the reason why he can get this very beautiful result is because he knows how to do this math trick. And 
the result is very beautiful because like I mentioned, it takes into, into account the, the contribution from ground state, the zero point energy, which is a quantum effect, and also uh, the Boltzmann distribution you know, of the energy, which is from the uh, classical thermodynamics. So this is a very beautiful result, actually. And to obtain, actually to, to estimate the, um, how do you say, the heat capacity, or the molar, well in this case we're still dealing with this uh, extensive property, so we're using the capital C over here. And more importantly, you'll see that we're dealing with constant volume uh, heat capacity, rather than the constant pressure. Because we're deriving um, internal energy, we're not deriving the enthalpy. Because from the physics, uh, for physicists, they are more interested in internal energy and Helmholtz free energy, uh, while for a chemist, typically you are dealing with enthalpy and Gibbs free energy. So here, uh, Einstein was a physicist. Um, so he started from the concept of internal energy, which is the sum of the energy of all oscillators, and this is the form he got. And then, in order to calculate the heat capacity, he has to use the constant volume one, because he's, he has the form for internal energy rather than enthalpy. So to do that, uh, he used partial U, partial T at a fixed volume, and again, the reason why we need fixed volume is because, again, we're using U, and also we're dealing with a quantum system, right? I, uh, I think I've stated this, uh, I think, more than two times, that uh, the first time when we reached uh, chapter four, we mentioned that for a quantum system, this energy level will be affected by the size of the system, which is the volume. So you have to fix the volume in order to have a fixed you know, discrete, discretized energy levels. If you change the volume, of course, these energy levels will be changed. So this is important a uh, constraint that uh, the volume is fixed. And then we calculate partial U, partial T uh, based on the expression of U as a function of temperature that we just derived. So again, uh, The approach, uh, of course, the, the thing that we want to find is Cp as a function of temperature. But in reality, uh, the, you can see that the methodology of the book is that we start from finding CV first, because this is from the physicist. Uh, point of view. And then, in order to calculate this, uh, we start from finding internal energy as a function of temperature. And then we calculate CV of T as at a fixed volume. Okay, so the philosophy behind this, uh, all these uh, sequences is something like this. We want to find CP, of course, in order to calculate delta H. But we don't know how to do that. So the physicists propose that we start from CV first. And to do that, we have to find internal energy as a function of temperature such that we can calculate this thing. And right now, we have the Einstein model. And later, we'll see that there's a different model proposed by Dubai, uh, which is a more accurate uh, model that can predict um, the low temperature heat capacity uh, more accurately. Uh, but nevertheless, the, 
the philosophy is the same. That we need to figure out what's the expression of u of t, and then we calculate this. And finally, we argue that um, uh, this is a very lousy argument, though. But you'll see why this is the case. Uh, so we argue that you know CP of t is close to this one. So in theory, we can say CP of t is close to C V of T for solids. Again, for this chapter, we're dealing with solids. And the reason uh, I've already mentioned earlier is because um, if you heat up your solid material, the volume expansion, the volume change is not that huge. Therefore, C P is close to C V. We'll see that again later. Okay, so the logic behind this is something like this. And the math involved is mostly over here uh, for the Einstein model. But the bottom line is that if you do that, uh, you already, if you already know the expression, then it's just uh, basic math. So it turns out that uh, the CV expression is fairly simple. You have this first term that is related to 3nk. Uh, three times the moles of the particles in the system, and then times the Boltzmann constant. And then you have this h mu, you know, square, uh, h mu over kt uh, square, and then you also have this exponential term. Then Einstein defined this h mu over k as a certain temperature, uh, as a characteristic temperature. Um, so it's named theta e. Uh, the reason why we have e over here is because it's for the Einstein model. And theta e is the Einstein characteristics temperature. So if you have just one mole, so for instance, if you're dealing with molar heat capacity, of course you, n is one, like I mentioned earlier. So CV is just three R, and then the h mu over kT can be replaced by theta e over t. And you also have these exponential terms being simplified into theta e over t. Okay, So for Einstein model, the result is fairly simple. That the CV, eventually, this is smaller, of course. You have 3R. And the reason why you have 3R over here, uh, because we have this N, but this is the number of particle, uh, and this is KB. So you have R for one mole. And um, well, I use this capital theta as an expression, 2 and Minus one. So, if if we are dealing with, for instance, high temperature approximation, let's say T is very large, um, and you see that uh, we can, if T is large, then these are small numbers, right? These are small numbers. And one thing that we can do is that, um, for instance, for this term, we'll say this is close to, close to 1. Because if t is large, this is close to 0, so this is close to 1. And for the denominator here, uh, because this is 
So if you expand this, use Taylor expansion, right? The first term will be something like this. And you also have a minus one behind it. So let's say these two will cancel out. So in fact, uh, over here, you know, at the dom denominator, this will be close to theta e over t squared. So it turns out that uh, the de denominator and this one will cancel out at the, uh, the high temperature approach. So when the temperature is much greater than um, the Einstein characteristic temperature, uh, so in fact this should be T much greater than uh, the Einstein temperature, uh, you have this approximation, right? Because uh, the denominator here uh, at the bottom will be close to this value. And this is close to one. Sorry. So eventually, uh, this will go back to the, uh, the Delon Petit uh, classical value, which is 3R. Um, but of course, for low temperature, uh, you, you'll have a different, uh, different uh, approximated uh, expression. But the problem with the low temperature approach is that it's far away from the uh, uh, still a little bit far away from the, uh, the, the experimental results. For, for instance, if you look at the case of aluminum, uh, this is the, uh, the curve over here uh, is the Einstein model. And here you have the Debye model, uh, which is the model that we'll talk about later. But uh, the dots over here are the experimental results, uh, which means that for Einstein model, it seems to be okay you know, for the high temperature uh, approximation. But if you go down to lower temperature, although you can see this kind of decreasing trend, but it's not falling onto the experimental results. So for Einstein model, uh, it seems to be fine for the two ends. You know, when temperature is close to infinity, indeed it goes to 3R, and when it goes to zero, Indeed, it goes to zero. Uh, but somewhere in between, at least, you know, especially for low temperature regime, um, the fitting is not that good. Or the fitting is not that good. And actually, the problem for Einstein model, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is there's a very important assumption that the oscillator vibrating are vibrating independently you know, about its lattice point. But in reality, we know that um, those atoms are actually coupled to each other through interim atomic force, right? So the vibration of one atom uh, on a lattice point will actually affect the vibration of a neighboring atom. Therefore, for Einstein model, um, it's still not that good. So although you know, it adequately represents actual heat capacity at higher temperatures and also the decreasing trend, but there's still a discrepancy that's due to the vibration of a single frequency. That's the uh, basic assumption of Einstein model. And recall that this theta E here, or you can say theta E uh, in the textbook, is is defined as h mu over kb, and there's a fixed frequency here. It's a fixed frequency here. So, for different materials, actually, then Einstein will assign uh, different values of frequency, such that for different materials, you will have different Einstein curves. Uh, characteristic temperature. So uh, I want to write over here. 
different materials actually uh, This will be different. But for each material, you only have one frequency, uh, one char characteristic frequency. And this is, of course, Einstein temperature. And you can call this uh, characteristic uh, temperature. And if you don't know, because H times mu is the energy, energy over Kb uh, will be in the units of uh, temperature. So uh, Einstein temperature is material dependent. And if we look at this temperature versus, let's say, CV. For different materials, you have different trends, right? But here is the Einstein temperature for material one. And let's say this is the Einstein temperature for material two. And here is the uh, Einstein temperature for material three. So for different materials, uh, you have different Einstein temperatures, which means that the characteristic uh, frequency corresponds to the uh, oscillation of those lattice points uh, will be different for different materials. Uh, however, if you can normalize that, you can normalize this by plotting all those data as a function of t over theta e, you will just have uh, a single line. So all those, all these three, sorry, all these three lines will merge into the same, you know, onto the same line. If you use uh, the normalized temperature as your uh, horizontal axis. So if you use this uh, as your normalized uh, horizontal axis, then all these three should merge. So that's the reason why the model is um, sort of a universal model. But of course, like I mentioned earlier, if you look at a real experimental result, uh, it still has this kind of deviation uh, away from the real experimental data from the real experimental data. So in reality, um, for each material, the frequency of vibration inside the material is actually having different modes. So it is possible that there's a frequency distribution uh, of those oscillations in the materials. It's not restricted to just one frequency. So in Einstein model, you can imagine that all those particles, all those lattice points, they are having the same frequency. But in reality, they, have, they could have different frequency, which corresponds to, uh, if you use wave to describe them, uh, corresponds to different wavelength and, or different wave vector. Right? So in this case, you'll see that the angular frequency, for instance, 2 omega, that's 1.93 omega, and 0.520 omega means that there's a distribution of oscillating frequency. As you can see here, uh, the frequency is lower, right? Well, comparing to uh, the first one. So if the wavelength you know, of those oscillation um, is like 2A, two, two A. A here means the, uh, the lattice constant. So this is the, um, I'll say the, the case with the shortest wavelength say two times the lattice constant, then these two neighboring particles are moving out of phase uh, with each other. So when one of them is moving to the right and the other will move to the left. And in that case, the wavelength will be two, uh, two times lattice constant 
and the frequency uh, will be denoted as 2 omega. So we don't have to worry about this at this point. So there's a certain frequency. But if you increase, say increase the wavelength, then we know that we have to decrease the, uh, the frequency, right? Um, let's clean this up. So for a, real, a more realistic approach, Um, or you can say this mu lambda. If you use a wave uh, to describe those uh, oscillations you know, of lattice point, then we know that uh, if the wavelength is short, then the frequency will be high. And there's a continuous distribution of those wavelength and frequency. So again, in the Einstein model, there's only one fixed frequency of the oscillator. But in the real case, uh, if you're dealing with real solid, in fact, there will be a distribution of frequency. So for Einstein model, again, uh, I've stated, stated this several times. You can say there's a fix, you know, or F here. Depends on your preference. Um, and the by, which is the model that we're going to talk about, actually propose that uh, there's a range, uh, let's say, distribution. Of mu or f. So those oscillations uh, for different frequencies corresponds to different wavelengths uh, of wave uh, in the material. So the heat transport uh, in the materials, or when you absorb heat, uh, for instance, the heat will be absorbed from uh, one side of the material into the, into the bulk of the, the solid. It's actually a kind of wave propagation. And we know that wave can transfer energy. So the energy will be absorbed by the system, by the material. And therefore, uh, the bias approach is uh, again, in the early 20th century, assume that there's a range of frequencies of vibration uh, rather than just one frequency. And uh, the lower limit of the vibration uh, is fixed. So there's a cutoff you know, of the, uh, the vibration. So the wavelength of the elastic wave is equal to the inter uh, atomic distance. Um, or theoretically, the shortest allowable wavelength is twice the interatomic distance, like what we just show over here. So this is the shortest wavelength case. Uh, the wavelength will be exactly two times the atomic uh, lattice constant. So that's the reason why he states that the shortest allowable wavelength is twice the uh, interatomic distance. But if you want just to do some back of envelope calculation, you can use just, uh, for instance, a lattice constant as an estimation, just to get the order of magnitude. So in that case, the neighboring atoms vibrate in, uh, in the opposite way uh, to one another, so they are exactly out of phase. For instance, uh, we can take the shortest wavelength roughly like five times 10 to the minus eight centimeters. Um, Therefore, uh, the frequency can be calculated by using the sound wave. So this is by using the sound wave of the, uh, um, of the solid over the shortest wavelength. And it turns out to be 10 to the 13th, uh, let's say, hertz. Okay. This is uh, second inverse, so the unit is the same as uh, hertz. So it's roughly. Um, I'd say it's a, pre it's a pretty large frequency. And it all depends on uh, the shortest uh, allowable uh, distance uh, between the two atoms. So this cutoff frequency is related to lattice constant. And we further assume that the frequency will be a distribution, say from zero to this maximum number. Okay, I'll stop over here.
and we'll come back later. But actually, uh, we'll have to, uh, I have to leave earlier, so uh, later we'll just have maybe 10 minutes uh, course after, you know, after the break. So, in Deng Xiang, I'll be to the next lesson. So, if we are using an uh, Einstein model, uh, like stated many times, that we are only dealing with just single frequency. But instead, if we want to do a more accurate estimation, uh, we have to assume that there are different frequencies uh, allowed uh, in the system. And, but for a range of frequencies, uh, there must be a you know, upper limit and a lower limit. Right? And for lower limit, it's much easier to understand because uh, if you have a very, very long wavelength, then of course, uh, based on wave dynamics, uh, the frequency will be zero. Uh, if you look at the, the figure over here, uh, you'll see that if you have a very long wavelength uh, vibration, the frequency will be lower. And with that limit, you know that you can go down to zero frequency. Okay? If you have a very, very long wavelength, uh, vibration. But there's a limit for short wavelength. Uh, if you're dealing with short wavelength, there's only uh, one mode uh, in this limit, which is something like this. You know, the neighboring atoms are moving away from each other. And therefore, the wavelength is approximately uh, two times the lattice constant. Okay? So if you have this, then you can estimate the highest frequency allowed. Uh, in this material system, once you know the lattice constant. So uh, in the textbook, uh, what it tries to tell you over here is that uh, the maximum frequency allowed uh, for this kind of wave dynamics can be determined by two factors. Uh, we already know that, let's say, uh, this is the velocity of the, the wave. So this is this is a frequency, and this is wavelength. And we know that the wavelength will be limited by the uh, lattice constant, right? The the shortest wavelength will determine the largest frequency. Let's say the frequency is velocity over the wavelength. Therefore, uh, the maximum frequency is limited by the shortest uh, wavelength allowed. And that is actually, uh, I say, two times the lattice constant. So this is lattice constant. So as long as your lattice constant is fixed, then you can sort of estimate uh, what will be the largest uh, frequency for the vibration mode. And you might wonder, what is this velocity, right? And it turns out that this is the, the velocity of the sound wave. So typically, we call this sound velocity. In fact, you can imagine that you send a wave uh, into your material, and the, the wave will propagate from one end to the other. And that velocity is actually the same as the uh, as sound propagating in the material. So that's the reason why we call this sound velocity. And uh, the frequency, of course, we've already seen that. And the wavelength will be determined by the lattice constant. And this is typically given. Okay, so uh, if the problem asks you about the maximum frequency that is allowed in this material system, typically they will give you this information, which uh, allows you to calculate that. Um, so lattice constant typically, let's say, is two times the uh, 
um, the bore, bore radius, maybe. So let's say it's roughly a, a nanometer, uh, or I don't know how large. Let's say it's a not a nanometer, and this is probably. Well, it's already given, so you can just use that to calculate. So in this case, uh, here it is uh, given as 5 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So this is actually 0.5 nanometers, so it's about 5 Armstrong. Uh, I don't know if this is correct. But, um, but the bottom line is that once these two are given, then you can estimate the maximum frequency, uh, which is this is 10 to the 13 hertz uh, in this case. And therefore, the frequency distribution will start from zero for the long wavelength vibration to this maximum frequency for the shortest wavelength uh, vibration of the material. And this distribution, in fact, will have something like this. So this is, um, let's say, the frequency. And this is the distribution function. I call this g of mu. Uh, this will go something like this. This is mu max. And it will cut off over here. So this is a, an uh, assumption. Uh, actually, not an assumption. We can, we can derive this. If we have time next week, uh, we can try to go through the details of the Debye model. So there's a distribution of how many uh, available modes for each frequency. So I'm just translating uh, what the tech textbook states uh, using words. So here it say, states that assuming the frequency distribution, which is this function, uh, is one in which uh, the number of vibrations per unit volume, per unit frequency range, uh, increases parabolically. So it seems to be a very long sentence. Uh, with increasing frequency in the allowed range frequency, which is you know, from 0 to mu max. So this is a low frequency, right? We can have 0 frequency, which is the long wavelength. And here we have the maximum frequency, which corresponds to the shortest uh, wavelength. But we don't know how many modes, uh, how many modes are allowed for each frequency. And it turns out that this frequency, uh, this allowed modes, or density of allowed modes, uh, will increase parabolically uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, the frequency of the oscillation. Um, I think this is just the results uh, from the derivation. And uh, if we have time, we should uh, probably derive the Debye model in details next week. Uh, and such that you'll understand why we need this kind of distribution function. So this is a distribution function of uh, allowed frequencies uh, in the materials, and it's something like this. We will, uh, I think we will have time to talk about this next week in details. But if you assume that's the case, then uh, the textbook also states this uh, in just a few words, like by integrating Einstein's equation over this frequency range. So Bear in mind that originally for Einstein model, there's only one frequency. But now imagine that you have different frequencies, and you also have the distribution function for those different frequencies. And you integrate that all over uh, the range from 0 
to this uh, maximum mu. Uh, in, in this case, it was denoted as mu d uh, because for the Debye model, so it's a capital D over here, uh, over here. So if that's the case, uh, you integrate all the possible modes and then calculate again the internal energy and then you take partial u, partial t to derive uh, heat capacity. Therefore, it turns out that you have something like this, which is more or less similar to the Einstein model, but with different um, exponential terms here. So you have x to the 4, and x corresponds to h mu over kt. And you also have this t to the 3 over here instead of t to the 2. And you also have a 9r over here. Okay. So if you do the same thing, like if you uh, go for high temperature approximation, uh, you'll see that this will also give you 3r. Okay, so this will also give you 3r. And if you go to lower temperature, um, and if you try to fit this model uh, to the experiment, then you will get a very good fit. So that's the reason why uh, this model uh, if you see the, uh, uh, the curve over here, uh, it corresponds to the, uh, the data points pretty well, unlike the Einstein model. Okay, unlike, unlike the Einstein model. And in this case, uh, for instance, aluminum, the, the, the by temperature, which is having a very similar definition as the, uh, the Einstein temperature, uh, is about 385 Kelvin. Uh, this is for aluminum. So similar to the definition of Einstein temperature, we have a Debye temperature defined as H times mu d over k uh, over the Boltzmann constant. And the mu d here is actually the maximum frequency that we just discussed uh, earlier over here. So for different materials, because you have different lattice constants, right? So you will have different cutoff frequency or the maximum frequency. So this is the material dependent factor uh, in the Debye model. In the Einstein model, uh, I mentioned that the, that single frequency is material dependent. But I didn't tell you how to determine those frequencies. Um, but in the Debye model, this picture is much clearer because you know that this cutoff frequency, mu max, is related to the lattice constant directly. Therefore, for different materials, we already know that it, those, I mean, they will have different lattice constants. So they should have different mu max. Okay, so the Debye temperature will be different. But of course, you know, naturally you, you think that then uh, if you do the experiment and then you, figure, you, you, you estimate the Debye temperature and the materials with higher Debye temperature, for instance, if uh, this Debye temperature is higher, then you think that, okay, so the Debye uh, or the maximum frequency is large, therefore the lattice constant must be low, right? Um, that's a natural thinking. But in fact, uh, this sound velocity is also material dependent, right? So there are several, uh, I think majorly two material dependent factors. Uh, one is the sound velocity and the second is the lattice constant. But the bottom line is that for different materials, of course you will have different Debye temperatures because the frequency will be different due to the difference in velocity, uh, sound velocity and the difference in lattice constants. And therefore, you know, uh, for different Debye temperatures, you will have different dependence of CV uh, in terms of temperature. So we will go through this again, like how to start from the expression of internal energy. And uh, that's actually a little bit of uh, solid state physics. And we'll try to derive more importantly, like why this distribution function is proportional to, say, mu square. Uh, this is what we will answer, uh, I think, next time. And that's 
That's not in that textbook, unfortunately, but, um, but it just tells you the, uh, the results, uh, which is fine if you don't want to go into details. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we have to go through that. So uh, like I mentioned, you have different uh, materials, then you'll have different divide temperature. And we've already seen that for aluminum. For aluminum, the divide temperature is around 385 Kelvin. Uh, so if you plot that out, you'll have something like this. And for diamond, for diamond, it has a stronger inter-atomic uh, bonding. And the divide temperature will also be higher. So you'll see that it will increase very, very slowly over here, not until you go to very, very high temperatures. For instance, a few hundred Kelvin, or even 1,000 Kelvin. You'll start to see the increase. Uh, for some materials that are weaker, uh, for instance, lead, silver, those melting points are, are lower, you know, uh, you will start to see the increase of um, T capacity uh, at a very, very low temperature. But the bottom line is that you see the trend uh, are all very similar. And if you normalize this axis with respect to divide temperature, then uh, all the lines will uh, converge uh, into the same line. So that's the same as the argument that I uh, mentioned for the Einstein temperature, right? So if you plot all those things uh, against T over the by temperature, then uh, all those lines should converge onto the same line, okay? So the Bynes equation actually give, uh, gives a very good uh, fit to experimental data, uh, especially for lower temperatures. And that's what the Einstein model uh, couldn't do uh, in the first place. So if you do the normalization, of course, uh, they will converge into the same line. And more importantly, uh, if you do that for the zero temperature, uh, you'll see that uh, the CV is actually proportional to T to the three. Uh, again, this is related to detailed derivation, so we'll, we'll see that next time. But uh, if you go down to lower temperature, the trend over here is actually proportional to T to the three. And that can be well predicted uh, by the bias model. Okay. So this equation is called the bias of T to the three law for low temperature heat capacities. So if you use Einstein model, you'll see a different trend. You'll see a different trend. And that cannot be well fitted to the experimental data. Okay, but if you're using the DeMai model, this is what you'll see. But interesting thing about uh, the heat capacity, I think someone uh, approached and asked me earlier, um, is that I mentioned that there's this increase of uh, heat capacity uh, when you keep increasing the temperature. So once the uh, contribution from the lattice points is reaching a maximum, which is 3R uh, in the classical limit, you will still observe a linear increase uh, of heat capacity. So because we ignore the contribution from the electron. So in fact, for the solid, uh, this is also what I like to mention at the very beginning of solid state physics class, that when we talk about solids, they're mostly uh, metals, right? Uh, if you haven't realized that yet, uh, you'll realize later that uh, for most of the uh, calculations that we're going to go through, they are mostly related to metals. Um, and that's the reason why thermodynamics is important for metallic people. Um, for metals, you, know, you have these atoms or lattice points. They are all connected with each other, and which gives rise to the vibration modes that we just mentioned earlier. Uh, actually, we don't, I don't need that many of them. Okay. Um, and imagine that these are the ions only, 
for solids or for metal or let's say metallic solids, you have the lattice ions plus free electron. Uh, because for metals, they are typically conductive. Right? So the electrons are free to move around uh, in the material. And therefore, you have electrons uh, that can move around. So these are called the electron gas. <coughs> so these electron gas can also absorb heat. Right? Previously, we've already mentioned the contribution from these uh, ions. So these are uh, for the Debye model. We only take into account the lattice points, uh, the vibration of these lattice points. Uh, but we haven't considered uh, the contribution from electrons. If they are like the particles that can absorb heat like an ideal, ideal gas, then uh, we also have to take that into account. So if you still remember for ideal gas, the heat capacity uh, perhaps is a constant. But in this case, for the electron gas, uh, the heat capacity is linearly proportional to temperature. Therefore, at high temperatures, you know, the lattice contribution is already saturated at 3R, but you still have a contribution from the electron gas. So this will give you 3R uh, in the high temperature limit, uh, but free electron will give you an extra contribution that is proportional to temperature. So you can say CV of T is uh, at high temperature is uh, 3R plus some constant times temperature. Uh, that's the reason why here I wrote uh, like 25 plus BT. Okay? And therefore, this uh, linear trend to the, fun, uh, to the temperature is the electronic contribution. So if, you, if you're dealing with the insulator, for instance, diamond, then you don't have this extra contribution. This is only the case when you're dealing with metals, right? So only when, when you're dealing with conductive uh, let's say metals uh, you will have this contribution from the free electrons. And that is because you have those electrons uh, moving like a gas, uh, like gas molecules uh, that is confined uh, in this uh, material. Okay, but overall, you know, for all the derivations that we just saw, we're actually uh, estimating CV uh, or deriving CV as a function of temperature. And also there are some other factors. Uh, like if there are not uh, harmonic oscillations, then you will have different modes uh, that has to be taken into account. But we ignore that at this point. And it is also normal to measure uh, actually CP as a function of T um, analytically express the relationship analytically because there are a lot of different factors that you have to consider in order to derive um, like an explicit form like this. So typically you will just do the experiment, uh, measure the heat capacity as a function of the temperature and then try to fit that uh, in your best way. But typically you won't see a very perfect form like this. And like I stated earlier uh, today, that actually we're, we're more interested in CP than CV. But all the derivation that we just saw, they're uh, related to CV. But we've seen that also today that the CP 
the difference between CP and CV is about like 1.2 something joule per mole Kelvin. So we can say that uh, it's pretty close to, uh, I mean, CP and CV are pretty close to each other. And therefore, these two terms, uh, we can say they're more or less the same, at least for uh, solids. Okay, if you're dealing with gas, uh, you know that the difference is huge. It's about eight, right? It's uh, one R. But in this case, if you're dealing with solids, uh, the difference is typically small. So though, you know, all the things that we're going to talk about, uh, we talked about, and what we're going to talk about next week will be CV. Uh, but this is, this chapter is actually about CP. And therefore, typically when you do the calculation, uh, the textbook will give you the information of what CP as a function of temperature is. And you'll see this kind of analytic, uh, empirical form, you know, of the constant pressure heat capacity as a function of temperature. And you'll see this kind of uh, polynomial uh, expansion uh, very often. So for example, if you're dealing with zirconium oxide, uh, it has this kind of allotropic transformation, which, is, it has, which means that it has a phase transformation at some certain temperature uh, from alpha phase to beta phase, uh, from mono, monoclinic uh, structure to tetragonal. Um, if you're going through this phase transition, then you'll see different forms of uh, heat capacity uh, beyond you know, and below the phase transition point. For instance, uh, this phase transition will uh, take place at about, uh, say, 1,500 Kelvin. And below that point, you have alpha phase, and the heat capacity has a form like this. And above that point, you have a different phase. Um, and beyond, like, 3,000 Kelvin, it's melted, so it has a different form. But for solids, uh, you have these two expressions. Uh, for alpha phase and beta phase. And you can see that for beta phase, it's nearly a constant. And if you look at the experimental data uh, shown on the textbook, it will be something like this. Below that 1500 point, it has this kind of trend. But above that point, it's almost a constant at about 75 uh, joule per Kelvin mole over here. Right? You see that. So for different material systems, um, if you have this kind of phase transition, you should expect that for different phases, they have different CP uh, as a function of temperature. And typically, in order to do calculations, you have to figure that out first. And those informations uh, will be given in the textbook. Um, if you have your textbook at hand, uh, it's typically in the appendix. Uh, on, you know, at the back of the textbook, let's see, like page, uh, appendix A, uh, if you go to appendix A or page 651, that's for the, uh, the sixth edition, uh, the new edition of the book, you start to see that uh, the, for constant molar uh, heat capacities, they can be expressed as uh, some general form. And then you have different uh, coefficients, like A and B and C. And the table on the next page, 652, uh, 652, will tell you like, how to plug in those numbers. So whenever you are dealing with the material that you, that you don't have this information of CP, uh, you should look up uh, on your textbook. Uh, in the appendix. Uh, in some materials, probably the text, the problem will directly give you the information. Like if it's going to be in your exam, of course I will tell you those information. Otherwise you won't be able to calculate. Okay? So, but please bear in mind that typically you will see a form like this. Uh, CP as a function of temperature and you have to know the, the coefficients A and B and C. And those are determined experimentally. So that's the reason why we call this uh, empirical form, right? And this is very different from what we saw earlier, uh, for instance, for, the, uh, for this one. It's entire, o almost entirely different from this. Because this is for physicists, and they are more interested in low temperature regime. 
Um, but for material scientists and chemists, typically they're dealing with higher temperatures. So they, they are more concerned about beyond 300 Kelvin. But for physicists, uh, typically they care about uh, those temperature dependence um, below 300 Kelvin and close to say 100 or 10 Kelvin range. So for these high temperature dependence, typically you use empirical uh, expression uh, to describe them. So I think I'll stop over here and uh, next we will start to, I think I'll go through the derivation of the bi model in more details and then we'll finish the uh, the most tedious part, which is the calculation of uh, delta H uh, for the rest of the uh, chapter six. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs>